Well, good morning. How is everyone today? That is good. That's what I like to hear. Today is a good day, is it not? Yeah, it is. It is. Sorry, I, uh, I got distracted all of a sudden because I was thinking about the promises of God. I was thinking about how God's promises are everlasting. Amen. I was thinking about how uh, there's really no possible way that I should be sitting down if God's promises are in fact. In fact, I should be standing upon them, right? Anyone got anyone catching my drift here? Yeah? Maybe we should stand upon the promises of God. Let's stand together and, and shout his praise today. In Isaiah chapter 43, the Lord lays out one such promise to us. This is what he says. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Amen. 
We are going to one day stand before the Lord, not consumed, not drowned, but very much alive in him. We are going to stand before him, and we're going to sit down for a magnificent feast. So get ready. change. Sorry guys, I messed up real hard. Great moment for you. You sound excellent. But when we sing this verse, we're actually going to sing it in a different key because I, yeah. Good thing the Lord is good, right? We will not be burned by the fire. feast with the Lord. That's a promise we can stand on, is it not? Let's lift up our praise to the Lord forever and ever.
And I will ever praise you. Yes, we will, Lord. Oh, God, you are my God. And I will ever praise you. Let's seek him. I will seek you in the morning. And I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me. And I will follow you all of my days. Lord, lead us step by step to your throne. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And you guide us every step of the way. Lord, we lift up our praise to you, not only because you are worthy, but because you are really worthy. We love you, Lord, and we want you to know that we, we want to follow you. We want to walk the path you've set before us. Lead us and guide us until the day Christ returns. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to be here this morning, and uh, we uh, just had a great weekend this past weekend with uh, our youth. We went to Change Conference in Toronto, and so if we're looking a little bit bleary-eyed, it's because we had limited sleep. And I'll say this in part, it's because our hotel decided to have a fire alarm go off at 6.30 in the morning, um, so that was fun. But we all we we made it to the event on time. Surprisingly, um, it did help in that regard. But uh, it was great to to be gathered together, um, and uh, we just saw uh, God do amazing things this past weekend. So um, we're happy for that. Uh, this point in our service is where we bring uh, our offering before the Lord, and we'll remind you that if you have a physical offering, you can leave it at the box at the back as you leave today, or you can give through e-transfer at donation at victorybaptist.ca uh, and. So we're going to uh, just pray for our offering, but we're also going to take some time, and I, I, I sense probably all of us have been watching the news a little bit more closely lately, and what we like to do is just offer up our prayers and petitions for events in our world and in our nation as well, and uh, we know that uh, God hears and answers prayer, and that God is in control. Uh, he is a sovereign God. Uh, nothing surprises him uh, that's going on. It might surprise us but it doesn't surprise God, and uh, we know that he is still sovereign and in control. And so we're going to just lift some of the needs of our world and our nation uh, up to him in prayer at this time. So let's just bow our heads as we, we pray for our offering and for the world this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we come before you as a God who does deserve our praise. You are an amazing and awesome God, the giver of all life and of salvation. And uh, Lord, uh, we do look forward to the day when we will feast in the house of Zion, when the, the new Jerusalem will come out of heaven, Lord, and uh, we will dwell in your presence forever. And uh, Lord, as we live in this world, we know that we live as exiles, uh, longing for home. And uh, we are looking forward to the day when Swords will be hammered into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks when the nations will make war no more. Uh, but we know, Lord, that we still await that day, that that day does not come through, through us, but it only comes through the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, we, we do look in our world and we see so much conflict and violence. And uh, we do ask, Lord, that uh, you would uh, lead the nations to yourself, that uh, people would come to see that peace comes through Jesus Christ. And uh, may you bring peace uh, in the midst of these conflicts. May you give wisdom to leaders as they make decisions uh, that have uh, an impact on the lives of thousands and sometimes millions of people. And uh, we think of Israel and Palestine. We think of uh, those, the, the tragic loss of life on both sides. We think of the, the thousands that are being displaced and the growing humanitarian crisis there. And uh, we, we do ask, Lord, that you would um, bring an end to those who, who 
seek to bring terror upon others and, uh, and afflict uh, innocent victims, women and children. And uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would bring peace and understanding to the midst of that conflict. And we know that at the same time that there's conflicts that are ongoing, that have been going on for some time. And uh, we still continue to hear of just so many people being lost in places like the Ukraine. And uh, for and out of those conflicts, Lord, is growing food shortages in many places in, in Africa and Asia. And uh, we, uh, we know that uh, uh, there are many today that go hungry each and every day. And um, Lord, we, we ask that uh, the church globally uh, might reach out in, 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 to, do, to those in need and provide uh, for their needs out of our abundance. And um, Lord, there are so many more needs in our world. And uh, may we be the hands and feet of Jesus in practical ways to those uh, who lack of what we have. And uh, closer to home, Lord, we pray for our, our, our governing, those in governing authority. We pray for uh, Justin Trudeau and his government. Uh, we pray for Doug Ford. We pray for Virginia Haxon, our local MP. And we ask that you would give them wisdom and we do ask for some of the, those things, Lord, that concern us. Uh, we know that in March there is a bill that will expand made to those with mental illness. And uh, we do ask, Lord, that that bill would not be passed. That we would be a country that would value life. And that we would do everything in our power to protect those who are hurting and those whose lives are broken by, by disease and hardship and uh, that they would come to see that their lives have value and that we would be willing to journey alongside those people and help them in practical ways. And so, Lord, may you be with them. Um, may uh, they uh, seek your face, and may you lead them towards yourself, Lord. And so, Lord, we ask this, that your mighty hand and outstretched arm would still be our defense, that your mercy and loving kindness in Jesus Christ, your Son, our salvation, that your true and holy word would be our instruction, your grace and Holy Spirit, our comfort and consolation unto the end and in the end. And this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, children, uh, up to the age of seven, uh, you can follow Angela at the back uh, to your class. And we, uh, we hope you have a great time in your class today. And if you have children that will be staying in the service and they're looking for something to do, uh, we do have clipboards at the back, and they can pick one of those up. They have coloring pages, and they, uh, they can feel free to get up at any time and grab those for your kids as well. And if you are visiting for the first time and you haven't checked your kids into our kid check system, you can just follow them out there, and Jim will be at the desk, and he will assign you into that. And it's just a way to keep our kids safe uh, while they are here. Uh, we're going to open our Bibles to the book of Second Peter, and we're going to be reading in Second Peter Chapter 1. If you're wondering, 2 Peter comes after 1 Peter, <laughs> if you're lucky. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your, election and your calling and election. 
For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, or as Peter greets the church, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege it is to be gathered together in the name of Jesus to be built up in the faith. May God be at work in each one of our hearts this morning. Here's a little scenario that I want each one of you to think through, okay? Okay. A young woman was late for her flight, and as she was hurrying through the airport, she collided with a gentleman, gentleman who was not paying attention to where he was going. When they collided, the suitcase that the young woman was pulling behind her burst open, and all the items she had packed in there just flew out onto the floor. The two apologized to each other for the collision, and the gentleman began to help her collect her belongings. He asked her, where are you headed? She said she was going on vacation. And as he helped her kind of repack her, her suitcase, he noticed she had packed a heavy winter jacket, a pair of winter boots, a toque, scarf, gloves, snow pants, and quite a few pair of thick wool socks. And so he asked her, where, where are you vacationing? The Arctic? She said, no, I'm going to Jamaica. <laughs> After that, she zipped up her suitcase and hurried off to catch her flight, leaving the man with kind of a bewildered look on his face. Why do you think the man was puzzled over the fact that the woman had packed winter wear for her trip to Jamaica? Well, I know there's a, a few of us amongst our, our congregation who are actually from Jamaica, and they know quite well that the last thing you need there is winter clothing. We all know that our destination informs us on how we should pack and prepare for the trip we are going on. You don't, you don't pack your suitcase with all your stuff and then you ask, where are we going? You first ask, where are we going? And then you, you prepare for your trip appropriately. You don't pack a snowsuit when you're going to Jamaica. You pack a bathing suit. Your destination will determine how you prepare for your trip. Peter understood this principle. Peter understood this principle. At the end of his letter, 2 Peter, in chapter 3, he tells the church, that the day of the Lord is coming and that the day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Peter tells the church, your destination is the new heavens and new earth. See, God has given all believers the gift of of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, and one day we will arrive at our destination. The new heavens and the new earth will be our home. We, as believers, we know where we are going. And in light of this knowledge, Peter asks us a wonderful question in chapter 3, verse 11. He says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? Since you, you know that this world will not last forever, and since you know where you are headed, what kind of people ought you to be? Peter even describes the new heaven and new earth for us in chapter 3, verse 17. He says, it's where righteousness dwells. See, when we get there, we can expect to find righteousness. We can expect to find all that is right and good and just and pleasing to God, for God himself will dwell there with us. There will be no sin. And really, I, 
I think that's just a, a hard, hard thing for us to even comprehend, a world without sin. But there will be no sin for everything that causes sin and all who do evil will have been weeded out of God's kingdom. And so Peter asks, if this is our destination, what kind of people ought we to be? What do you pack in your suitcase for the new earth? What do you pack knowing that you're going to the place where righteousness dwells? See, our destination will determine how we prepare for the trip. This morning we're starting a new sermon series entitled, Who We Ought to Be Growing in the Grace and Knowledge of Christ. We're going to be studying 2 Peter together over the next six weeks, and we're going to learn what we need to pack for the new earth. If you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, please open it with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Before we study this passage, just going to open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good, and you have been good to us. You've given us your Son, and through him, eternal life for all those who believe. We have a great and glorious future ahead of us, and one day we will see the new heavens and the new earth, and you will dwell with us there. We together come before you and ask, how should we prepare for such a wondrous hope and a glorious future? What kind of people ought we to be? We ask that you use the truth of your word to prepare us for the day of the Lord. Guide us by your spirit so that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, God, and seek to be obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostle Peter wrote this letter, as it says in verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. And it can't be known with certainty which churches he is writing to, but it's often thought that he is writing to the churches in Asia Minor, the ones that he addressed in his first letter. However, I do want us to look just at how he addresses the recipients of this letter. Peter says to them in verse 1, To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. First, I want you to see that Peter names Jesus Christ as both Savior and God. Both Savior and God. It's very important that you see that. See, Jesus is both fully man and and fully God. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. Second, I want you to see that it is through the righteousness of Jesus that faith is received. Meaning faith is a gift from God. It is not, it, it, it is not by the effort of a person, but faith is given through the saving righteousness of Christ. I want you to just think back to, to Peter. When he first believed, Jesus had asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter replied by saying, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, to which Jesus said in Matthew 16, 17, blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Even faith is a gift from God. Third, Peter calls the faith we receive through Jesus precious. Our faith is a precious gift. It is of the greatest of value, for it is through faith that we receive the gift of eternal life and are forgiven of our sins. And being that our faith is so precious, we need to ask this. What are Christians to do with their faith? What are Christians to do with their faith? How are we to take care of it? Well, I want you to jump down to verse 5 for a moment. Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith. Make every effort to add to your faith. Think of faith like a house. Okay? If you were given a house to live in, what is the, one of the first things that you would do? 
furnish your house. You would furnish your house. You wouldn't leave that house empty. You'd want to add, you know, a bed, a couch, a TV, a a fridge, a stove, and, and so on. Think of it like this. Let's say after two years of living in this house that you have been given, you get around to inviting your friends over, and so they come over for a visit. But when they arrive, they find out that you haven't made any effort to add a single piece of furniture or an appliance. What do you think your friends would think? They they would think there is something wrong here. There's a problem. Because a house isn't meant to be left empty. See, we, we, we are to add furniture and appliances to our house. You see, faith is like a house. We are to make every effort to furnish it. Our faith is not meant to be left empty. It says in James 2, 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. See, God has given us faith as this precious gift, and we are to make every effort to add to it. Now, it's not appliances and furniture that we we add to it, but instead we are to, to furnish our faith with godly virtues, which Peter begins to list in verse five. But before we look at these virtues, let's ask, why are we to add godly virtues to our faith? Why are we to add godly virtues to our faith? If you notice in verse five, Peter said, for this reason, make every effort to add to your your faith. What reason? For what reason are we to do this? To find the reason, we need to back up just a little bit. We're going to look at verse 3, which says, His divine power, or God's divine, or God's power, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Not only does God give us faith, But with his power, he supplies us with everything we need to live a godly life or to live in obedience to Jesus. Not only does God give us a house to live in, but he gives us everything we need to furnish it. Our faith is not meant to be left empty. And I want to point this out to you. Notice how our faith does not come fully furnished. Notice that? It doesn't come fully furnished. Instead, we are take, to take responsibility of our faith and add to it. We're to make every effort to add to it. God makes it possible for us to add to it, for it is only by his power that we are able to become more and more like Christ or to grow in his character. But we are to take responsibility for our faith and add these godly qualities to it. We are to participate in his divine nature. Look at verse 4. Peter writes, through these, through God's glory and goodness, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, and here it is, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. The divine nature, or God's nature, is moral perfection. Moral perfection, or in other words, God never sins. He's perfect. Jesus never sinned. He is perfect. It says in Hebrews 4.15, Jesus has has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So to be able to participate in the divine nature means that God has graciously given you the opportunity to be free from sin and conformed to the image of his son. See, when Jesus comes for us at the resurrection of the dead, every evil desire that wars within your heart will be removed. And you will be like Jesus, sinless, moral perfection. It says in 1 John 3, 2, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
Now listen, I want you to listen now to what John says next. It's deeply connected to what Peter is saying in his letter. He says, all who have this hope in Jesus, all who have this hope that one day they will be made perfect in Christ should purify themselves just as he is pure. If, if we know that our, our destination is purity in Christ, then we should make every effort now to purify ourselves and get ready to meet Jesus. Ah, uh, this. We will not be perfect in all we do until Christ returns. We will still struggle with sin as followers of Christ. We will. But we are to make every effort to be free from sin, to flee from sin, and furnish our faith with godly virtues as we rely on God's power. If we know that because of our life in Christ, we are headed to the new earth where righteousness dwells, the question is, what should we pack? What should we pack? You know, if I told you I was headed there and you looked into my suitcase and you saw all that I had packed was like evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness, and I had it all jammed in there. I even had to sit on the suitcase just to get it close. Would you think to yourself, you know, oh, he, he's going... He's going to the place where righteousness dwells. No, you'd rather, you'd think, I, I don't think he's headed towards the place righteousness dwells. Because that's, that's not the type of activity that goes on in the presence of God. The truth is, it sounds more like I'm going to hell with a suitcase like that. It's not that we as Christians will not struggle with these sinful issues, but instead of us trying to hold on to them, we need to confess them to the Lord so that we may be forgiven of them and we are to make every effort to remove them from our suitcase, to pull them out and replace them with godly virtues. For godly virtues are something that we can take with us right into eternity. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.8. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. See, exercise, it has some value in this life. It's good to take care of your body. But godliness, he says, has value both for this life and the life to come. Adding these virtues to our character helps prepare us for eternal life with Christ. By learning how to live like Jesus now, we are investing in our eternity, which just is amazing. And by doing so, we actually begin to reap the benefits now in this life. There is no greater life than the life of following Jesus Christ. So let's ask, what godly virtues are we to add? What godly virtues are we to add? You know, what are we to furnish our faith with? Starting in verse 5, Peter lists the virtues that we are to add to our faith. And this is not to be thought of as, say, an exhaustive list, nor are we to think of it each one must be mastered one at a time, connecting to the, before, you know, the next one before we can move on, but instead they're all interconnected, and we are to work to uh, possess each one of them in increasing measure. So let's take a few minutes just to look at what God expects us to furnish our faith with. See, we are to make every effort to add to our faith goodness. Goodness is moral excellence. It is to do what is right and avoid what is wrong. We are to be good. We're to be good in what we think, to be good in what we say and what we do. And what we need to recognize here as, as human beings is that we 
don't get to set the standard for what is right. Although that's not how our world sees it. God sets the standard for what is good, for only God himself is good. A person who has faith in Jesus is to make every effort to live by the morals of Christ. Next, we are to add knowledge. Peter is speaking about the knowledge of God that that can only come by having a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And through this knowledge, we learn what God's will is for us, and we are to put this knowledge to work in our life. For what benefit, what benefit would it be to us to know what God wants for us in our life, but yet we never act on it? It would be to no benefit at all. It would be just a waste of knowledge. Instead, if we have learned what, from God how he expects us to live and behave, then you are to put that knowledge to work in your life. For example, if you know God expects you to be trustworthy, to be a person of your word, make every effort to be trustworthy. God will help you. Remember, by his power, he has given you everything you need for a godly life. You can trust him to help you to be a trustworthy person. See, a person who has faith in Jesus is to make every effort to grow in their knowledge of God's will for them and be obedient to his will. And we gain this knowledge through spending time with God in in his word, in prayer, in in fellowship with other believers, and and being at church. Next, we are to add self-control or self-restraint. To live a godly life requires self-discipline. We're to resist our sinful desires, and instead we are to seek the desires of the Lord. You know, it takes takes self-control to be less like the world and more like Jesus. That takes self-control. But God, he's faithful. He will give us, he gives us the power to resist temptation and be obedient to him. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. A person who has faith in Jesus is to to make every effort to to gain control of themselves through the power of the Holy Spirit so they're not giving themselves over to evil desires, but faithfully following Jesus. Next, we're to add perseverance or endurance. See, we, we are to patiently wait for God in all circumstances, all situations, whether in, in pain, whether in persecution, we are to persevere in our faith. We are to willingly follow Jesus even even when it's not popular or easy. A person who has faith in Jesus is to make every effort to stand firm in their faith. Next, we're to add godliness. Godliness is to live in full obedience to God so that his character is fully reflected through our character. You know, whether whether people are watching or not. That's a true test of character. How are, what do you like when no one's watching? A person who has faith in Jesus is to make every effort to grow in the character of Christ. And the best way to grow in the character of Christ is, is to spend time with him. Spend time with Jesus. His character will rub off on you. Next, we're to add mutual affection. Mutual affection is the love for fellow believers. It's the love for fellow believers. As a church, we we should pursue a family-like devotion to one another, for we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I want you to think of this. When you get to the new heaven and new earth, so when you get to the new earth, it won't be just you and Jesus. It's not just you and Jesus there. We all will be there together with Christ. And we will be together forever. 
meaning you're stuck with me for a very long time. <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> the point is this. In an eternity, we will live out Christian love and unity perfectly. There'll be, no, there'll be no fighting or discord in heaven. Jesus expects us to make the effort now so that, we, so that the world may get a glimpse of what eternity will look like. A person who has faith in Jesus will make every effort to grow in their love for their church family. And I'll add this, a good way to show your church family you love them is by committing, committing to them and becoming a church member. In membership, you're saying, I commit myself to care for you and to serve in the ministry with you. See, attending a church and being a member of a church is similar to the, to the difference between dating and marriage. And the question is, are you dating the church or are you married to the church? There's a difference. If you want to know about membership, you can pick up one of our membership packets at the information desk, or feel free just to speak to me uh, or one of the elders or other pastors. The final virtue on the list that we are to add is love. This is agape love. Agape love is the most powerful the type of love. It is sacrificial love. This is the love that God has for his people. This is the love he has for you and I. It is because of this love that he sacrifices only son on the cross for our sins. And Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. See, Christ has loved us with an agape love. And he has given us this command, love each other, as I have loved you. See, we are, we are to lay down our life for one another. We are to be like Jesus. Instead of looking to serve your own interest, which is so natural for us to do, we are to deny ourselves and serve the interests of others. You know, if you see someone carrying a heavy load, you are, take the, you are to take the time to help them carry it. Even... Listen to this. Even if the load they are carrying is their own fault, you are to have compassion on them. Just as Christ had compassion on each one of us, you are to have compassion on them and help them carry that heavy load. A person who has faith in Jesus is to make every effort to sacrifice for the good of others. You know what I noticed as I was preparing for this sermon? The fact that Peter instructs us to add these virtues to our faith tells us that we, we don't already have them. We don't, we don't have them on our own. It's not like we have all these godly qualities and then God gives us uh, faith so we have this place to keep them. It gives us faith so that by his power we can furnish our faith with them. We, do made, we need to make every effort to add them to our faith and continue to grow in them. And I, I, I'll say this. I see many of these virtues at work within you. And I just want to encourage you just to continue to grow in them and increase in them. We need to be cautious that we don't come to a place where we start thinking, you know what, I'm good enough. Or, you know what, I, I've loved enough. But we should continually have Christ's example before us and seek to grow in his character more and more. Final question I want to ask is this. What do these virtues do for us in our faith? What do these virtues do for us in our faith? Kind of like, why add them? Look at what Peter tells the church, starting in verse 8. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is the desire of your heart to be effective and productive in the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Do, do you want to be fruitful in your life for Christ? Peter tells us, if we 
possess these qualities in increasing measures. You know, if our cup overflows with these qualities, not just a, like a single drop or two, but, but if we have them in abundance, and you might be thinking, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have it in me to be that virtuous. Remember, God's power has given you everything you need to live a godly life. Godliness does not rely on your power. But as you make an effort, God will bless you and bless your effort and your your cup will overflow with these virtues. And if we possess these qualities in increasing measure, we will bear fruit for Christ. But, as Peter says in verse 9, but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting they have been cleansed from their past sins. It, it, if your faith is in Jesus and yet you are not working to add these, these qualities to your faith or, or grow in them, Peter's saying you have just lost sight of the work that God wants to do in your life. Or as Peter would also say, you are ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. You, you're just wasting the knowledge that God has given to you if you're not working at becoming more and more like Christ. Or your faith is an empty house. Another way to say it is, if you're not making an effort to add these virtues to your faith, you're living as a person who does not have faith. Or maybe you never had saving faith at all. Look at Peter's conclusion to the matter. He says in verse 10, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Peter tells us as Christians to make every effort to confirm or or to prove or to give evidence of our calling and election. How does a Christian prove that God has called them to follow Jesus through the gospel and that he has chosen them or elected them to salvation? How how does someone prove that? Peter's point is that the proof will be seen in their character. For if they have a true saving faith, they will make the effort to grow in these qualities. True saving faith will not remain empty. The logic is this. God gives people faith. And along with that faith, God gives them everything they need to add godly virtues to their faith. And if a person claims to have faith and yet there is no hint of them even trying to live a godly life, their house is just empty of any furnishings, then they mustn't have saving faith. For if they did... The evidence would be in their character. In a similar way, you know, if someone told you that they were headed to the place where righteousness dwells and you looked into their suitcase and it was just packed full of sinful things, would you think that's where they are headed? However, if you looked into their suitcase and it was just like overflowing with godly virtues, you'd be more inclined to affirm in them that they are headed to eternity with Christ. Now, we don't have the ability to look in a person's heart to see if they have saving faith. However, this instruction is is not for us to to go around trying to determine who is saved or not. This instruction is for each of us as believers to make an effort to confirm our own calling, our own election, and we do so by growing in the character of Christ. Christ. For as Peter says in verse 10, if you do these things, you will never stumble. If you do these things, you will never fall away from your faith in Jesus. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These qualities do not earn you eternal life. We are saved by faith in Christ. But instead, these, these qualities confirm that your faith is not empty and it is a faith that saves. My encouragement to each one of you is to do as Peter has instructed us to do. Make an effort. 
Don't neglect your faith. Take it serious. Make every effort you can to add these godly qualities to your character. For if you possess them in increasing measure, you will be effective and productive in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Confirm your calling and election. Just don't don't sit there guessing if you're saved or not. Believe in, the G- believe in Jesus and follow him faithfully. My hope for each one of you is that you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our destination is the new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. Let's pack appropriately. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the gift of salvation. We praise you for the gift of faith, for it is through faith in Christ we are saved. We praise you for cleansing all who believe of their sin with the blood of Christ. Forgive us, Lord, for the many ways we have failed to reflect Christ's character. Forgive us for the fighting and discord. Forgive us for the selfishness and greed. Forgive us for the pride and idolatry. Open our hearts to the good news of Jesus Christ so we may believe and by your power help us to add to our faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. We desire to be effective and productive in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to be obedient to your word so we may confirm our calling and election and grow in the character of Christ. Our hope and desire is to receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we be found ready when he comes. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Scott and the band forward as we sing of our salvation in Christ. Let's stand and sing in Christ alone.
in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Oh, my first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. stand in your power, and we ask that you would add to us all of these virtues, that our faith would not be empty, but would be confirming our calling and election in you. Amen. You may be seated. Just going to close with a few announcements. I'm going to start off with a couple of reminders. For those of you who are part of the greeting ministry, Pastor Jason will be having a meeting at 12 o'clock after our 11 o'clock classes. Uh, you'll be meeting in room 119, the boardroom, and lunch will be provided. Second, for those women who are planning on attending the baby shower for Rose and Solomon and her new daughter, uh, Eva, the shower is today at the church at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. There is no registry, but uh, gift cards, big size clothing, diapers, wipes would be a great way just to so support uh, Patrick and Rosen and their, their new daughter. If you're able to attend, uh, it would just be great to, to see your support this afternoon. If you're interested in joining our visitation ministry or learning more about it, please pick up one of our visitation booklets at the information desk after the service. And uh, you can also reach out to Linda Gingrich, who leads this ministry. We're looking for a few more volunteers to, to join us in visitation. Uh, our plans is uh, coming up in late November to have our first set sets of visits for the year. And we just want to get our team established. So just reach out to Linda if you are interested in serving this way. A reminder to all our, our church members, today is the last day uh, for voting to re-elect Dave Archer as elder. Dave Gingrich and Chris May are scrutineers, so please cast your ballot just out in the fellowship hall after the service. And as you came in this morning, you may have seen that we are running the Operation Christmas uh, ministry once again this year, or as we oft, a lot of us know it, the shoebox ministry which is being led by Susan McKelvey. So simply what you do is you pick up one of the shoe boxes from the table. You also pick up one of the, the pamphlets there that has all the details about this ministry. And what you do is you choose, if you're going to shop for a boy or a girl, you choose what age uh, you're going to shop for. And then you shop and you fill this, this box with items. They can be some fun items some, or, or some needed items. So you can do some toys. You can you know, do some personal hygiene products. There's a list of items in here that, that are good. There's some examples out on, on the table. And what you do is you return this box full. Uh, for November 12th, and then these boxes get distributed around the world to, to children who are in need, and through this distribution, it's a way, too, for the gospel to go forward. They put a uh, gospel presentation within the boxes, and I know they're usually uh, connected with a ministry that is serving children. Also, what you'll find when you get the brochure is that 
They ask for a $10 donation for each box that you submit. This just goes toward uh, the shipping costs. So please grab one of these if you, if you feel led to do so, or maybe you get a couple of them. Get shopping and uh, return them by November 12th. Uh, we're having our Sunday morning classes at 11 for all ages. If you need to know information about that, you can go to the information at the desk. If you're new or visiting today, we're just so glad that you have joined us. We'd love the opportunity to get to know you better and give you more information about the church. You can fill out one of the Connect With Us cards that you find in the seats in front of you. Return it to the information desk there to one of our greeters. We've got a gift there for you. And it would also, it's, I will give you a call in the week just to introduce myself uh, to you. And as you go into your week and into the world, I'm going to send you with 1 Thessalonians 3, 13 and 14, which says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. God bless you as you go.